Have you ever wanted to apply a global filter to all of your queries in NAD Framework? Let's mash on that. Hi, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the ASP.NET Monsters. Today's episode is brought to you by Abvair, continuous integration services for Windows developers. Dave, Simon, James. it's going to be back. It's welcome. good to be back. <laughs> I, I've been on a little bit of a hiatus here. Yeah. I think this is the first time we're all together since we cracked 100 episodes. I think you're right. Yeah, I think yeah. you're right. So in, in here we go. And uh, this is actually something that I have recently been working on, and I do have some questions. So I'm glad that our resident, Julie Lerman uh, of Canada, is here uh, bringing, bringing the real stuff to us here in EF. Yeah. So uh, last episode, we started talking about some of these new features that that were released as part of the Entity Framework Core 2.0 release. And today we're talking about global query filters. So this is a pretty cool feature. Um, I, what I'm going to do is just show a couple of places where I think it might be useful. So what I've done is just built a, a very simple sample application here using ASP.NET Core 2, where we have employees. And I, I use Gen Foo to just dump a bunch of uh, fake people into my employee database here. Uh, just first name, last name, title, and something called a company ID, which we're going to see in a bit, and then an is deleted flag. So the idea here that we would implement some sort of soft delete. So instead of actually deleting the users, we just set the flag to delete it, and they'd still actually stay in the database. Not necessarily saying that's a great approach to use, but uh, it's it's a good example to show how this feature with Entity Framework might be useful. So initially, I haven't implemented this feature yet, we'll just run the app. And we what we should see is just a big list of people in the database. And with GenFoo here, I, I tried to use a distribution of like about a quarter of these should be deleted, approximately, uh, and then evenly distributed between the three companies somewhat randomly. Uh, so here we're seeing a bunch of deleted people on our main page of the, the application. I forgot how fantastic our title filler is with a marshal. <laughs> There's also princesses and dukes. And... <laughs> yeah. I, I was initially thinking that was going to be a job title, and it did not come out as a job title. Mm -hmm. So I just went with it. It works. OK, so if we wanted to apply a global filter here where we said, when we ask for employees, I, I only want to get those that haven't been deleted. Uh, we could do that very easily using this new feature uh, here by overriding the on model creating and just specifying some configuration here for the employee model type. So we do model builder dot entity employee. And then use the has query filter here, and I would just specify using link. Uh, I think you got a P on the end of your type name there, uh, Dave, behind oh, your box. Yeah, yeah. That's there you my, go. Thank you. That would be. That's why we like to have you around, James. Simon doesn't tell me when I'm doing something wrong. He just kind of sits there and laughs at me. No, oh, how are you going to learn? <laughs> that's you true. Wrong. Okay, so we we only want those where it's not deleted. So where is deleted is false. Now that should apply that filter now anytime I query for employees. I don't need to change in my application where I've uh, actually fetched these, which is over in my page model using Razor Pages, which we haven't talked about yet. Uh, but here I'm just saying employees, context.employees.toList. So now when I run this, I should get only those that have not yet been deleted. starting up and it looks like yes they are all set to false so there's none that have been deleted and if we just go to double check so I always like to see the code the query that was uh, generated there I'll try to zoom in so you can see it uh, there's that where clause so it said where is deleted equals zero 
So provided, I mean, if you're building indexes appropriately and whatnot, then this doesn't even necessarily seem like this. This kind of feels like if I were adding a field, if I was adding, if I were to add the like a soft delete within his de deleted uh, flag on a field, this to me kind of feels like a little bit of a shortcut for in terms of implementation. Um, however, on on the flip side, it's also a way that you're probably going to catch a lot of things, and I could actually see this working really well in for multi-tenancy situations. Yeah. Yeah, so that's kind of where my mind went initially as well, and that's why I had that company ID in there. Uh, just kind of dreaming up, and this is really not a fully featured implementation of multi-tenancy. It was just to see how easy would it be to do. And what I, the, the thought that I had was, what if uh, this was a system where we were hosting employees for multiple different companies that were clients of ours, and those were tagged by company ID in our database. So. Let's imagine a world where we were able to just inject the company ID here. I seem to be having an off by one error on my keyboard placement here with my fingers. <laughs> There's one thing that I learned in elementary school was home row. Let it yeah. my fingers. You know, we learned that in elementary school too because uh, our computer teacher spray painted all our keyboards black so we would learn the keys. Wow, that's serious commitment. We had that is like hardcore. Um, we had like a, a tea towel taped over the, the keyboard so you put your hands under the tea towel and tie. Yeah, that would require the teacher to actually watch and make sure that you kept the tea towel there. <laughs> this is a more permanent solution. I, I gotta tell you that like based on the level of importance that my elementary school computer teacher assigned to typing. I would have expected it to be like a much bigger thing in my life. Yeah, it is. Likewise. Also, Oregon Trail would have been, because that was the other half of the class, right? You type for half the class, <laughs> and then you played Oregon Trail. And then try not to die from dysentery. <laughs> exactly. All right, so imagine then that we were able to pass in a company ID here to our context and then apply a where clause where we were on, always only searching for the employees or querying for the employees within that company. That would be kind of neat, except that, uh, how do I get that company ID now? So, because right now that the, our employee context just gets injected kind of automatically into our, our uh, controller, or in this case, to our page model uh, with Razor Pages. So that's where things get a little bit hairier. Um, this is the usual way that you add a DB context here. So, uh, well, normally your connection string is stored in a config file, but just keep things simple here, it's in line. Uh, but you say add DB context, you give it the type, and then uh, you specify your options here saying use SQL Server with that connection. So we're, we won't be able to do that now if we also need to somehow grab that company ID for the current request and pass it on to, the, to our context when it gets created. So we're gonna comment that out and kind of do this manually. This is basically what ends up happening when we're using that add DB context shortcut more or less anyway. Uh, so what I'm doing is just saying add a transient uh, employee context, saying there's one per, per request uh, to, to our service collection and build up our options manually. So I, I create a new DB options builder for my context and then tell it use SQL Server with that connection. So that's what we were doing before. Uh, but now, and this is where it gets a little hokey because I don't, this isn't the best way to do this for sure, but I just wanted to show kind of an easy way of doing it. Uh, but I'm grabbing the HTTP context accessor now from my service provider. So the, this code gets executed whenever uh, there's a request that comes in and we need an instance of the employee context to get injected somewhere. So, right, so this is basically a factory. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and we're trying to find the contact, the company ID. So my idea is that it would be a route parameter or a route value somewhere in our URL. So like the first thing in the URL, probably after the, the site address would be slash the company ID and then slash wherever we're going in the site. Um, so then I, I just get the route value company ID from, from the, the route and then I create the employee context here, passing in the company ID and the options. So now it should just automatically grab the, or create a context that's gonna query the right company. Uh, if I run this now, it won't work because I, I don't have a concept of that 
route parameter. And this is where I thought, oh, I'll use razor pages here. It should be easier. Uh, but I don't know razor pages very well yet. And I don't know how to define like a global route value as part of my, my routing. So what I'm going to do here is just kind of add one manually. So I'm going to say company ID as a an integer that, that kind of gets uh, put into my URL here for this page. So when I run this now, it should just give me, a, I think, a 404 because I won't have a company ID specified by default, but... Default's in a zero and then some kind of uh, injection just, error. It was just a 404, like it didn't find the route because it, that company ID was required. But now uh, I've right. specified the company ID as one and you can see that these are all one. Scrolling down the, the right here. So that was actually a route parameter at the top of the page there that was... Yeah, so that's specifying... Oh, okay. A, I, I need to learn more about how these Fraser page things work specifically, but... But it's uh, a directive that kind of says... It's kind of like uh, attribute-based routing. In, yeah. Uh, right. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I guess the other approach that you could take if you wanted to get a little more sophisticated would be to pull a claim off the user or something yeah, like so that for the... This is just one part of multi-tenancy. The other one would be to make sure that the person is actually seeing the ones that they're supposed to use. You might pull it out of a claim or you might grab it out of the database and every request matching that user up to whichever company they're supposed to be accessing if they only access one of them. Um, claim would be would be a really good way of doing it because then you would do it once at login when they, when they log into the page and then it would just apply to them for, for the lifetime of their session. Yeah, because the, the current approach is just having it in the yeah, URL. So, so that, anybody can change it. I don't have any. Yeah, that feels like a little bit of a security problem. Yeah, I don't have any authentication or authorization set up on this site at all. Uh, so this was just more to to show yeah, how yeah. we could inject it in there. But you can kind of see how that's a uh, could potentially be a useful way, at least on the entity framework side, to uh, to do that. So the nice thing then is that if you if you inject that ID into your constructor like this, there's no way then, and, and you set up the correct filter, uh, there's no way that anybody could ever use this context to query the wrong thing, as long as they're going through the the uh, DB sets. I, I have to play around with it a bit to see what happens if you start trying to write your own queries for this. So if you do a from SQL, that's probably a way to bypass mm -hmm. it. So that that's one thing to watch out for. We weren't judging you, by the way, Dave, you know, as far as putting it in the in the URL, it was we were just <laughs> no, no. I was going to bring up the same things, right? So I, I don't want somebody to take this and go and implement multi-tenancy and say, look, it's a multi-tenant site now. Uh, there's definitely more to it than that, and that's something we should maybe do an episode on. Uh, I think there are actually some some uh, NuGet packages that people have made that incorporate some of that. So it'd be interesting to see maybe combine that along with this feature to get the full package. That's it for global query filters with Entity Framework Core 2.0. Oh. Tenancy in exactly this way. Uh, no, so we're still scared of 2.0. Oh. Um, so we're still on like 1x stuff. Um, so we, we have basically this implemented just in a slightly different way, but still using our model creating to intercept mm. collections oh interesting and does it does it append a where clause somehow to the sql query yeah yeah okay yeah we found a library that does it uh, i see so doing the same thing but right so the yeah, now this stuff it should, should be a little easier too it's surface and it should be a little bit easier yeah. to do this sort of thing in a supported fashion cool Okay, well, I guess we're done. Yeah. So, thanks everybody for coming out and listening to another episode of the ASP Net Monsters. Remember to like, comment, and share. Uh, if you write a comment down below, we'll read every one of them, and if we answer your question on the air, we'll send you a sticker, which I never have. Like, you would think that I would learn to just, like, put a sticker here. in this room. Well, I'm glad that, that somebody here is on the ball. This this is my last. Um, I have twelve stickers here. This is the last twelve of these stickers. Fortunately, I have a few still. I think you have the most left, but somehow you never have one. <laughs> <laughs>
with you, which is, I think, why you have so many left. It's probably true. Yeah. I, d I did give away a bunch in Austin a few weeks ago, so somebody down there has some. All right, well, thanks everybody for joining us, and we'll see you all next time. Cheers. Bye.